All right. I think we've uh, slowed down on attendees coming in, so let's go ahead and get started. Uh, first off, thank you all for joining us here tonight, and uh, um, thank you for uh, taking the, your time to learn about spray drills, learn about the industry, um, and I hope you come with lots of questions because uh, I love answering questions. I love educating um, and sharing knowledge that that we have here at Agri Spray Drones. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and share my screen and jump into this. Um, I should say, I guess, before we get started, if you have questions, um, you can drop them in the chat uh, below. Uh, should be the, the Q and A down there at the bottom. Uh, there also is the chat. To be honest, I don't know which one you're supposed to use, so just use either or, and uh, we'll figure it out from there. And we'll uh, we'll save time. We'll answer all the questions there at the end. Ryan may be able to answer some questions as we go through. Um, if anything, he can't answer. I'll answer at the end, and we will leave some leave plenty of time if you want to, uh, you know, actually ask verbally speak you know you can raise your hand i believe somewhere on your screen should be raise hand and uh, i'll call on you turn your mic on you can ask a question there at the end too all right let's get started okay everybody see my screen okay good ryan all right yep all good here perfect all right Okay, um, so what are we doing today? Um, today we are pretty much doing a very general, broad overview um, of the ag drone industry, um, of the uses, use cases, uh, the equipment, um, and we'll leave plenty of time for a Q&A at the end. Uh, I am Taylor Moreland. I am the owner of Agri Spray Drones. And so here's kind of a flow of what we'll talk about. So most time on spray drones, talk about what's, what's new and then questions at the end. So a bit about myself before we get started. Um, I am a farm boy, grew up on a farm in Western Missouri. I have been flying drones since 2014, uh, spray drones specifically since about 2018. Um, we actually just moved to uh, Butler, Missouri, um, but our headquarters is here in Boonville. I'm actually standing in the warehouse right now is down here working on some parts inventory. So I thought I'll just conduct this from here. So my computer's here anyways. Uh, and in addition to agri spray drones, my wife and I also run a, um, a nonprofit called Farm Mobility. And I always like to, when I have a chance in front of an audience, kind of share a bit about this because it is a bit of a passion of mine. Um, so Farm Mobility, we, we design and build and send mobility devices to children all over the world. Um, that's a, a, a GoBro there, a little wheelchair. My son's name is Brody. He was born a spina bifida. And so we developed a couple of devices for him and uh, it's a fun side project. We get to help a lot of kids out and uh, use some engineering skills uh, and develop those, which actually help in agri spray drones as well. So if you guys want to learn more, that's from mobility. Um, you can just Google search it. You'll find us. All right. If you have anybody that we can help, please let us know. Thanks. Okay. Moving on to the meat and potatoes of the presentation here. Spray drones. So agri spray drones, who are we? Well, essentially we are providers of spray drone, really all ag drone technology. Um, our mission statement here is to empower rural America. And we do this through the use of this technology. It is much more than just spray drones for spraying crops. This technology has brought uh, jobs, has brought opportunity to rural America. It's a huge passion of ours to be able to help out um, Know, bring people back into agriculture it's exactly what this technology does and uh, we're so excited to um, to be a part of it uh, this is our team um, here at agri spray drones uh, well part of our team i guess this was actually taken last year uh, so we've grown quite a bit there's uh, uh, 21 of us in total right now i believe um, mostly here uh, in Missouri, but we do have folks uh, spread across the country. Uh, and apart from our team here at Agri Spray Drones, we have a dealer network um, across the country as, as well, a growing dealer network and a growing reseller network um, as well. And I thought maybe since I'm already down here uh, in the warehouse, I might give you guys uh, a little bit of a tour of our facility um, if you'll ride along with me. Um, so this is kind of our, our parts uh, warehouse right here 
we're actually going through a whole new um, inventory system. Um, we've got thousands of parts and uh, the need for parts is very great in this industry. And so we're revamping for next year. Over here is our drone inventory, uh, mostly T20Ps and T40s. Uh, we do have some T30s as well. And then of course, batteries, chargers, um, spreader tanks, all the other accessories. Um, and then over here, this is kind of our uh, our shelf of fixed and uh, two fix drones. Um, you know, again, these this is ag equipment, really. These drones are all ag equipment. It's not, you know, we think of a spray drone, um, it's much more like ag equipment, much less like, um, like a sprayer. And so getting these things fixed in a timely manner and fixed right, and having a knowledgeable team to do that is a very high priority for us, which is what we have going on right here. We've got three drones currently in the process of uh, of being worked on um, and varying degrees of of repairedness. Um, so this is where if you call into um, to our facility in the summertime or any time that you're spraying, um, you'll be talking to probably one somebody in in our tech department there in our tech room. That's where all the uh, all the magic happens essentially. Okay. So turn my screen back on. All right. So first thing we're going to talk about here in um, in the spray drone realm is regulations, because of course uh, these are drones; uh, they do operate um, in you know federally controlled airspace. So FA regulations are definitely um, a piece of the puzzle here. And so I'm not going to dive into this. We could easily have, you know, an entire 30 minutes just on this topic alone. But when it comes to regulations, what do you need to know? Uh, the first three things here really are the biggest pieces of the puzzle. That's your 107, your drone pilot's license, your 137, your air applicator exemption, uh, and your 44807, your heavy drone or 55 pound plus exemption. Um, so a lot of these are kind of like learning a foreign language. Um, and honestly, the hardest part of this is the 107. You do have to study for this. Uh, we do have resources for study guides that can help you in the process. The 137 and 44807, those are exemptions. They're not licenses. So what that means is you don't actually take a test to pass those. You file petitions uh, for the exemption. Um, so that's the part that is like learning a foreign language. And that's where we really hold your hand through this process. I believe we actually have Charlie, our compliance manager, um, on as an attendee uh, right now. And he's who works with uh, with all of our uh, all of our customers, our dealers and, and resellers to help them uh, through the process and make this simple. So expectations as far as how you can get through all of the um, you know, all of the regulatory pieces of the puzzle. On the FAA side, that has sped up tremendously over the past uh, past uh, year, really, or the past really six months. It sped up tremendously. Um, FAA has kind of put together a, a task force, I guess, if you will, will to really um, handle spray drones specifically. So we we're seeing these exemptions go through in as little as six to eight weeks from the time of filing. So if you file your exemption now, plenty of time. Uh, to be legal on the in the FA's um, you know eyes before spring spraying season. There's of course your state applicators licenses. This does vary by state. Some states this is easy. Some states uh, there's a, a bit more hoops to jump through. And every state, well, almost every state, is kind of changing some of these regulations um, as time goes on. Because again, these spray drones uh, are very new. The industry is is very new. And please drop your questions in uh, if you have, because I'm sure there's lots on that on that topic there. Okay, so when we talk about spray drones, really, you know, majority of spray drones are in the row crop industry. Um, but as these drones have have come to market um, and as they've been deployed across the United States, uh, we have seen a lot of other uses for them. So why sprayer drones? Let's answer that question. Why sprayer drones and what can they do? So again, the biggest uh, the biggest use case for spray drones is as an on-farm aerial application 
tool. You know, if you have wet ground, um, if you have tall crops, um, spray drones are a way to provide your own air application on your own farm. They are actually uh, more so a tool for commercial or custom application um, on farms. Um, it does give a bit more flexibility um, to how air application is done on the farm. They're also a very good tool for small plot application or small field application. Things that have never actually been able to be done by the air just because, you know, helicopters and airplanes can't do some things like spot spraying, test plots, you know, high accuracy, repeatability, small fields that are surrounded by trees, things like that. And then, of course, outside of row crop and outside of, uh, of pasture, there is a ton of applications. Wetland forestry is, is a really big one in the southwest right now. We have a lot of customers uh, getting into that. Um, right of way, mountainous terrain. Uh, we Specialty crops, the, you run the gamut, you know, orchard, vineyard, uh, fruit and veg. Um, there are very specific use cases um, in those specialty crops and even heavy lift applications as well. So we talk about row crop use, which is the primary driver um, for why spray drones are being adopted across the U.S. What exactly are we talking about? Well, we're talking about low volume application. So primarily between a half gallon to three gallon, usually two gallon per acre. Um, of course, you can do more, um, but again, these do have smaller tanks. So they're not meant to replace a ground rig. What I mean by ground rig is, um, you know, a John Deere sprayer um, with 120 foot booms. You're not going to replace those types of applications. So broad acre herbicide, um, a drone's not going to be able to do there as as efficiently um, or uh, as as well, potentially. Um, and then obviously heavier products. Um, so if you're putting on lots of fertilizer, then a drone is not going to replace that application either. So much more similar to crop dusters or helicopters and airplanes, or we're doing fungicide insecticide primarily, uh, corn, soybeans, wheat, um, you know, uh, that's you know, corn is really the, the, the biggest crop that is driving the use um, of, of spray drones, fungicide on corn. But of course, they have been used for wet, used for wet field burn down, just like crop dusters. And cover crop overseeding is actually a growing use as well. Very versatile tool for that. And of course, uh, as I mentioned earlier, these drones are more versatile than uh, a, a helicopter, an airplane, and even a ground rig. In some cases, when you have smaller fields, uh, or challenging um, applications. So, just an example, and I just have a couple of these uh, on the agronomic side. Um, and this one here is is just to prove a point, I guess, um, that we don't need volume. You know, we talk about low volume application. You know, or, you know, a lot of people think, especially if you if you understand herbicide, um, that and really any any product uh, for that matter, that you need volume to get coverage. Well, that's how a ground rig does it. So that's how your John Deere sprayer is going to get coverage is through volume. A drone provides coverage through air distribution. Um, this was, well, an impromptu side-by-side -side, actually two years ago um, that a customer called us on and said, you got to check this out. Um, so you can see ground was wet, been wet for a long time. He uh, did two gallons per acre um, with Liberty uh, with the drone out of necessity, he had to really. He just did half the field, didn't know if it was going to work or not. And then nine days later, after it rained again, of course, uh, ground dried out. He came back with his ground rig, 14 gallon per acre, uh, getting core to Liberty. Um, and this was picture was taken a month after the ground rig application. Um, so what this tells us is two things. First off, timing is incredibly important when it comes to really any application on any crop. Um, you know, but especially when we look at uh, herbicide applications, timing is incredibly important and sometimes weather does not cooperate. And that's where drones kind of play a factor. Um, it's, uh, some people say it's like a time machine. Um, it gives you time uh, back whenever you would not have had it because of weather. Second thing it shows us is, again, you don't need volume to get coverage. And this proves that uh, pretty perfectly. And this is just, uh, you know, so primary use, obviously, is fungicides. So the big question is, do drones work for fungicide? Uh, well, drones really aren't doing anything different than a helicopter and airplane is doing. Um, they're doing it, uh, you know, it's, it's application from the air. 
Um, so we're doing it at the same rates. Typically, two gallon per acre is what a lot of crop dusters are doing. Um, so drones can do that same thing as well. So this is just a, a test plot. And as you can see, of course, um, in our in our plots, uh, our three strips, you can see that where they applied, it is more green, it is healthier, it did yield more than the untreated uh, check. So that's just proof that um, fungicide application does work from the air with a drone. Uh, so just, you know, a simple recap here on sprayer drones in the row crop industry. Uh, really, you know, when we look at our, our customer base, um, we, we kind of have, you know, two groups of customers um, and sometimes they're, they intermingle, but we have guys who are getting drones on the farm, doing it themselves um, on demand, when and where, how you want those rescue applications that we saw earlier. And then we have you know, a lot of guys, and this is where the big opportunity lies, is custom aerial application, the ability to offer localized services, which has actually never been able to be done in the aerial application industry. Um, you know, there, there used to be, a, you know, it seems like in some areas, a lot more um, aerial application services. And, you know, it, at least in a large swath of, of the Midwest, demand for fungus application is growing tremendously. And there are not enough local pilots to service that demand. And so we get um, a lot of pilots who just kind of travel the Midwest uh, through fungicide application season. Um, and it's hard to get a localized service. So this is a great way to do that. Uh, again, you know, they, they are low cost um, and much, <laughs> much lower cost than helicopter and airplane. Um, and efficiency is kind of the, the big thing everybody has questions on. Where does efficiency lie? Well, when we look at, you know, the, the two main drones that we know the most about um, right now, the T20P and the T40. Um, there you can see the efficiency uh, below 25 to 30 acres an hour. The T20P, 40 to 45 acres an hour with the T40, I uh, say currently in parentheses, uh, because there actually are developments uh, right now that uh, DJI is working on with the T40 on the firmware side to actually increase that, uh, things like flight speed and stuff like that. All right, so second biggest application uh, that drones are being used for is pasture and forage production. And, you know, so I, I grew up on a, on a dairy farm. Uh, we had dairy cattle and uh, row crops and beef cattle. And the reason that we didn't farm our pastures was because they were full of rocks, ditches, saplings uh, and there are fences everywhere and those are all barriers and they all increase the operation cost for application with a ground rig in pasture um, and so drones don't have wheels so application uh, cost or I guess main, or operating cost in pasture with the drone is really no different than it is uh, with the ground rig so and the other piece of the puzzle there is you know the the biggest application in pasture typically is herbicide, group four herbicides, you know, things like 2,4-D um, and, you know, graze on stuff like that. They're all group fours and they work very well at ultra low volume applications and brush control uh, drones make that uh, much easier than a backpack uh, sprayer or, or a uh, sprayer on the back of a four wheeler. And of course there is opportunity for the granular application and cover crop. We have seen actually a lot of uh, interseeding of clover in pastures. This is a short video here of uh, kind of some before and after on pasture herbicide. Um, there's chaparral, very commonly used uh, herbicide. And I should note that all of these applications uh, were done at a low volume. Um, so two gallons. And in this case here, I think this is actually less than two gallons uh, per acre. So you can see that air movement that I was talking about earlier, uh, that penetration through the canopy that the drone is able to provide. Um, if you set your parameters correctly, use uh, the proper um, droplet sizes, speeds, heights, uh, you can get very good penetration uh, with the drone at a low volume. When we talk about low volume, we're not, we're not talking about lowering the rates of herbicide um, that's actually put on per acre. We're talking about just lowering the total volume. The rate of product is actually the same. This is the most impressive to me. Uh, this is, uh, again, two-gallon rate, uh, two-gallon volume. Uh, with remedy and yeah that's uh, that's mesquite looks pretty dead to me wild and and the great thing about about pasture herbicides is they're all labeled for air application 
Um, another short video here, just some specialty use applications. And this is just the tip of the iceberg, really. Um, again, this, this is the this is the T30, um, but a lot of the same features as some of the newer drones here. So there you see um, some some very steep terrain following. I mentioned mountainous terrain. Uh, so again, no wheels means that you can actually create custom flight routes uh, for very challenging types of applications, forestry, um, you know, mountains, orchards, vineyards, uh, things like that. Um, it's And then when you look at like a vineyard application, you know, a lot more testing needs to be done, but you can see there's a lot of air movement here. And vineyards, orchards uh, are using blowers already uh, because they know that they need penetration through the canopy. They need to blow that product through the canopy. So a drone could actually be a, a tool in some cases. This is cool here. Um, we've, we've done a fair bit of this ourselves. Uh, greenhouse painting, uh, a niche application, uh, but a very useful one. And, you know, I'm not going to dwell on this as far as the operation of a spray drone, how to actually operate one. Um, again, that's a very, uh, it's a very long uh, conversation and explanation. Uh, but this is just a general workflow. We do have videos on our YouTube page. You guys uh, find us at Agri Spray Drones on YouTube. We've got uh, several videos on there. Um, of the different drone models, different types of applications. Uh, we try to, again, show you guys everything that, that we can um, uh, through there. So check those out. Um, yeah, we'll leave it right there. Okay, what's new? All right, I didn't actually have time to prepare any slides for this. We're going to jump out of the presentation and over to Google Chrome. Um, so what's new, uh, at least from a uh, from an equipment standpoint, um, the T20P and the T40 has been, okay, we'll, we'll talk T20P first and we'll go T40. All right. So the T20P, I don't know if you guys are familiar with the T40, but the T20P is essentially the little sister to the T40. It is the exact same drone, literally the exact same drone minus four motors, shorter landing gear, smaller tank, 20 liter tank. Um, and that's kind of pretty much it. Uh, everything else, it's got like 90% of the parts are the same. The cool thing about it is you can actually use the T20 P, or T40 battery, T40 or T30 battery in the T20P. What does that mean? Well, you know, really all, all spray drones have tried to maximize uh, lift capacity, uh, maximize e efficiency by... Uh, you know, trying to you know reduce the amount of weight needed on the frame on the battery and put all that weight carrying capacity into the tank. So the T40 um, is a heavy drone, heavy lift, uh, high tank volume, short flights. So it's designed to get up in the air, spray it out quick, get back, fill the tank, swap battery, get back up in the air, and not really meant to stay in the air for a long time. And there's not many drones that are actually meant to do that. Uh, the T20P is meant to do that. Using a T40 battery, uh, since it is really half the drone, with double the battery, you can increase your flight time uh, substantially. Um, so spot spraying is, this is a tremendous tremendous tool for spot spraying. Uh, not only because of the flight time, but also because of the transportability. Um, and because it uses... Um, really the same system as the T40. It is incredibly easy to use. It works with a lot of really cool software um, and you know, the range is great. It's it's just a, a great drone. And then I'm, I'm on a T20P soapbox here. I, I love talking about it because I think it's an awesome drone. Um, so apart from spot spraying, everybody's like, oh, that's great, but I don't do that much spot spraying. And you know, why would I get a T20P? Well, when you look at cost, so dollars per efficiency unit and when you look at tank volume per efficiency unit uh, with the t20p you really maximize on both of those factors so t20p obviously it's going to cost a fair bit less than the t40 you only need two batteries to operate it because the batteries they last so long that you can charge up the one battery while you're using the other one uh, one charger you can get a quiet 7500 running watt generator um Throw everything in the back of your truck. We have a video on this on YouTube. You should watch it and go to the field. And so for an on-farm tool where you want a drone that you can easily put in the back of the truck, not have to have a big trailer for, a big setup for, and go spray that 100 acres that is in dire need 
of a fungicide application or herbicide or you know go hit those those five spots of uh water hemp that you know you're not gonna that's that are that, that you missed or that you know you had crop ground out and now they're growing up you know this is an incredible tool honestly on the farm i think you can pay for this drone in in two fields if you hit it right and and save your crop with those two fields on the farm you might not have time to spray your entire farm with a drone but you might consider having one of these to do those two applications now the t40 is not new um, you guys probably know that the T40 has actually, it was actually released about this time last year. So it's gone through its first uh, full season um, and we've got a ton of experience. So that's actually why I'm excited that there's not a, you know, on the DJI side, there's not a new big drone um, to hit the market because the T40 had there i mean we ourselves had over 600 drones uh t40s in operation ac across the country um we serviced a lot more than that and so we saw anything and everything that could go wrong based on the amount of t40s that were out there this summer and the amount of problems that we have we can tell you that this is a very very reliable platform and it's only gotten better so even though it's not new there has been updates um to the newer t40s uh the different mounts um and a few other small uh small things firmware dji is continuing to work on their firmware uh they were out at our place just a few weeks ago um to do some testing on some different different new firmwares and uh to increase efficiency uh and improve operability so really excited about the t40 uh going into next season because of that reason okay uh next a bit smaller uh the m3m and the m3t so these are small mapping uh, drones, uh, surveying drones. And so M stands for multispectral, T stands for thermal. Now, a lot of people you know, think that they're gonna get uh, a scouting drone and be able to survey crops and start a, cust or start a custom crop scouting service. Well, just kind of my, um, you know, when we think about this from an agronomy standpoint, the M3M doesn't actually tell you what's wrong with your crop. It does give you some crop health metrics um, when you combine it with some software uh, that you can then do do some targeted scouting. So it is, is a good tool for that. You know, but we were kind of discussing here in the office, you know, what's what's a better tool for a farmer? If they're going to get one camera drone, is it the M3M or the M3T? And I might actually argue the M3T might actually be a better tool for some farmers uh, because the multispectral side of the M3M has use cases, but unless you know what multispectral is, uh, then your use case is limited. And some of, you, some of your NDVI indexes can actually be uh, achieved through regular uh, RGB or regular camera mapping using a tool like PIX4D. The M3T, the thermal, has a regular camera. You can do mapping with it. You can get NDVI index, and then you have a thermal. Everybody knows what a thermal drone is or a thermal camera is. It sees heat. And so if you have cattle, great drone for that. Uh, for an avid hunter, okay, there's that. Um, and then there's actually some work being done on the thermal side with crop health that you can't do with a regular camera or a multispectral camera um, just by, you know, sensing heat of the crop. So I I don't know. I kind of, I'm kind of leaning more towards the thermal side sometimes when it comes to what drone should I get on my farm, depending on what you're doing, of course. All right. A um, couple of things uh, before I turn you guys loose on the questions is on, on some software stuff. So uh, DJI Smart Farm is something that uh, just kind of came out, still kind of in testing, I guess. Um, but it's a really cool tool um, for kind of opening up access, um, kind of like a gateway, if you will, into ortho mosaic mapping. What I mean by that is what you see here, essentially using a mapping drone. You can see we have satellite imagery right here from google and then we have drone imagery right here from a drone um that's ortho mosaic uh mapping so that's w from an m3t or an m3m and so you can use this uh to create field boundaries uh very accurate field boundaries with updated uh images of where your actual trees are at not relying on satellite imagery and then you can actually uh, uh you can do some variable rate although the variable rate tool on on uh, smart farm web is limited um, and then you can do 3d flight routes. I don't have an example of that on, on smart farm, but I do have an example of that on Terra, which Terra and smart farm are the same. 
a smart farm is just the the online version. So if you're actually able to create a three dimensional map like this right here, that you can then create a spray route um, over the top of. Uh, so I think my computer's slowing down here, uh, not showing the. Yeah. Anyways. Um, but you can actually create a, a three-dimensional flight route where the, you don't use the radar from the drone for your height. You actually use the um, uh, the uh, imagery, the point cloud mapping from, from the mapping drone. All right. Um, and then lastly, uh, PIX4D. I talked about PIX4D a little bit, but they have had some new uh, updates here this summer that have now been able to be tested and proven. Um, and that is uh, their magic tool and a couple other other features. Um, so, you know, people ask, OK, if I want to get into spot spraying or I want to get into crop scouting or I want to, you know, uh, do something along those lines, like what's the workflow? Well, it starts with imagery. And so you know, that's kind of what, what it shows right here. You know, the mapping drone, the camera drone doesn't tell you what's going on with your crop, but it takes the images of your crop. Then you use a tool like PIX4D, which we'll look at here in a second, which actually analyzes that imagery. And then you can create uh, really cool customized uh, prescriptions uh, with, and then you put that into the spray drone. So this has been the workflow that's, you know, kind of been uh, uh, missing is the good software and the tool like a spray drone to actually use that software. Um, so I'll jump into PIX4D real quick just to show you what that looks like a little bit. Um, this is just a, a little map that we've created here on on site. And so in PIX4D, you can create obstacles just like you can on the on the Agris remote and create boundaries. We're using, uh, you know, imagery from the drone on here. And then just with regular RGB imagery, imagery, you can use a magic tool to actually train the AI to find what you want it to find. And so pixel patterns, basically, uh, and then you can customize that. And so right here, this is just a silly test we had, but um, this is like a no spray area. So we painted that area not purple, painted this area purple. And so it sprays just, just the purple areas, but it flies uh, the entire boundary. And again, you can have this as customized as you want, and you can use the AI tool to smart, um, the, uh, the magic tool to do this for you. Really, really cool. Um, really cool piece of software. Okay. I've rambled on enough, boys. It's time for questions. The reason you guys are here. Um, so I'm going to see if I can figure this out. Stop share come back here and uh, we're gonna pop up our Q and A first. Uh, we'll go through that. Uh, I'll read the question and I'll try to answer it. And if you guys hit the raise your hand button, if you wanna talk, um, then I'll call on you uh, maybe after I get through all, the, all these questions. Okay, Jesse says, what's your typical season of drone work when, uh, where you are? What can you do with drone ag in the off season. We actually were just talking about this today um, with uh, with some, we had training, uh, customer training here. <clears throat> and a um, guy from Wisconsin was talking about spreading salt, uh, you know, ice melt, um, brine. Now, is that a great use for a drone? I don't know. Um, you know, I, there's trucks that already do that. Um, but there again, there's places they can't get. So that's a possibility. Um, you know, you got to think outside the box, uh, in some of these cases and in some cases, maybe it's not worth actually, you know, you know, trying to do some of these really weird niche applications, unless you have a bunch of free time, because your bread and butter is definitely going to be, um, you know, in, in the summertime, uh, you know, in, in crop essentially, um, there are, so when we talk about off season, so that that could be outside of fungicide application um so that could be you know spot spraying herbicide is outside of that time frame that could be um cover crop application that could be pasture herbicide application um there there's uh invasive species uh management you know wetland ponds lakes that's that kind of thing uh a few questions for when it's time to ask them all right nathan uh what is your home run sales pitch to potential customers who are skeptical about drone services for spraying? 
Um, all right, man, you got a bunch, Nathan. Awesome. Okay. All right. Home run sales pitch. Here we go. Uh, I don't have one, but, um, what I, what I focus on really, um, is what, you know, what problem can the drone solve? And, uh, I, it, it really depends on what kind of apl application you're, you're looking at doing. And a lot of cases, the demand is going to be abundant. Um, so long as you put yourself out there, um, you understand the drone very well. I would definitely try to understand what the needs of the customer are first before I give a sales pitch. Uh, understand the needs, marry those needs with the capabilities of the drone. Um, is it easier to have a spraying business in the Delta region or in the hills? Uh, hills, probably, I would say. Uh, that if you're in the Delta, you know, it seems like... Uh, I don't know. I've, I've been through the Delta. I've talked to a lot of guys in the Delta, um, you know, rice country, um, cotton country, and aerial application seems to be a bit more abundant through the Delta, uh, a lot more spray planes down there, and uh, application costs uh, or what you're going to pay for that application is uh, going to be a little bit less, you know, so there's guys doing uh, uh, airplane application for eight bucks an acre down there versus 15 to 20 uh, for air application and fungicide season across the rest of the Midwest. Um, so hills where planes can't get to, you can charge more and do a better job potentially. All right. Realistically, how many acres can one T40 cover in a growing season uh, when being very busy? This, of course, depends on what type of ground you're operating on. Big, wide open, flat quarter sections, you'll get a lot more done. Uh, than small hilly fields. Uh, you got a lot of travel time in there. Um, so we've got uh, one of our um, one of our customers does. They have a large scale commercial application uh, business with. Uh, they run in sixteen T forties, I believe, and they it's run it's a very tight ship that, that they run. Uh, they have a teams of two. They have two T forties, um, and they have four operators per team: two pilots, a field guy, and a safety guy, kind of thing. Uh, and they run like clockwork, big open fields, um, and is where they're at. And they they average this year 700 acres per day per team. So, so 350 acres per day per drone is what they average. Um, and so that's kind of maybe on the upper end um, of what you might actually realistically expect when you are working 10 hour days. Um, lower end, well, it just depends what you're doing, really. All right. Is the part 4507 and the 137 uh, have to be applied per drone? Uh, is this purchase or is this? Okay. So 4507 and 137, that is entity level, uh, meaning that whoever owns the drone um, or the entity that owns the drone should be the one applying for it. And anybody who works that entity or that company um, is able to operate under it. So it's an umbrella underneath uh, that, that company. So yes, that, is, that is company level. Each pilot needs to have a 107. Each pilot needs to have a class three medical. Uh, we didn't cover that earlier. Um, and each drone needs to be in numbered. And uh, you, your state applicator's license just depends on your state. Sometimes it's just, you know, one person in the company has to have it. Sometimes everybody has to have it. So it just depends on the state. Uh, talk to your pesticide uh, uh, license department uh, bureau, um, whatever it's called in your state. Okay, here we go. When's the T-50 coming out? I'm uh, waiting for this one. Okay, uh, so the, the T-50, when is the T-50 coming out? Um, yeah, this has been pushed back. Uh, so originally it was, you know, slated for this fall right now. Um, and then it was like, uh, maybe February. And then it was, well, maybe May. And just heard that maybe it's going to be June or July. Don't have a solid answer on this. I wish I did, but we don't. What we do know is that it will very likely not be here in time for application season this coming year. Now, the other question you didn't answer is, what is the T-50? Uh, and how does it compare to the T-40? Although we don't have all the answers because, of course, we have not actually tested one. Um, what we do know is that the T-50 in the global market global meaning us uh will not have a 50 liter tank 
And actually, even in China, where it's currently at right now, it only has a 40 liter tank. You can get a 50 liter tank as an option only for high volume application because it really doesn't increase, increase your efficiency on most applications for a big tank unless you're doing high volume work. Um, and they're just, they're not making that available in the global market. Don't ask, I have a theory, but don't ask me why necessarily. necessarily. Um, okay, and then what what makes it different? So if the tank's the same size, what else is different on it from the T40? So uh, a better camera for mapping purposes, um, meaning like surveying, orthomosaic mapping, which is silly in my opinion. Why would you use a drone that weighs 100 pounds um, empty to map your field whenever you have uh, M3T or M3M? Um, but anyways, uh, and then uh, it does have... Uh, a different rearward and downward facing radar does different mean better don't know um haven't been able to test it we do know that uh dji is actually working on improving the t40s downward and rearward uh, uh radars right now uh through some firmware changes and that's proven a uh six, a, you know with some success on the beta firmware that we've tested um so that's the really the two main differences they're very small differences outside of that so i would not expect any more efficiency out of the t50 really all right long answer to a short question what is the average uh, okay what is the average acres in a, a single drone can cover within a day um yeah so i can't we kind of answered this um average depends on what you're doing um it could be um uh, you know it could be so all right i had a guy call me Last it was last year, um, T30 season really was what it was. He had a T30. I had a guy call me last year, and uh, he he's it was at six six thirty in the morning. So I answered, and he said, "Hey, I just want to let you know I got, got done spraying seven hundred fifty acres today." I said, "Nope, it's six thirty in the morning," and he said, "Well, over the past th- twenty three hours." So if you have an exemption to run all night uh then yeah you can you know spray a lot of acres depends how 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 hard you want to work and how big your fields are you got small fields at high volume you're not going to get much done um how wide does this does a spreader go so how wide can you spread with it um you know realistically 35 feet is going to be kind of your max spread width because you want some overlap when you're spreading uh you know cover crop seed fertilizer whatever it is you want some overlap uh, because it can be like a tapering off as it as it spreads out. Um, so 35 feet is kind of the, the max. Um, it is adjustable and it does depend on density of uh, whatever product that you are applying. All right. Um, we, we don't have a, we have really good data on the spray pattern with the T40. Um, we, which by the way, on the spray pattern with the T40, you know, what, what we tested, the T40 has, the widest and most consistent spray pattern has, has to do with the the props and the um, how they're angled, uh, essentially. Um, but on the spreader side, we don't have really good data because there's so many different variables and you know, all the different types of uh, dense, you know, seeds and and rates and, and densities of product, uh, heights, and all that kind of stuff. All right. What chemical applications are best suited for drone? What cover crop seed are best suited for the drone? All right. So... Chemical applications best suited for the drone, best suited, uh, is going to be fungicide and insecticide. Uh, why? Well, because um, fungus, so several reasons. First off, fungicide and insecticide have uh, been done for decades through aerial application and uh, millions of acres every year through with fun- with, uh, with helicopters and airplanes. So we know it works, all right? Um, secondly, those products are labeled. Fungicide and insecticides, all have aerial application labels that are very, very limited on on restrictions. Uh, so two gallons per acre is is um, is is the usually is usually is the norm, if not less, uh, for fungicide insecticide. So best suited. That's what those are. Uh, what cover crop seeds are best suited for the drone? Um, so small seeded cover crop. Um, there's a range here. So your brassicas. So uh, and and um, all right. So clover turnips radishes top three if i had to pick them um that that would be it um because they're small seeded meaning that you don't you need you know 10 pounds an acre sometimes less um which is great for a drone uh and you really need to establish those early meaning prior to when the crop is harvested so you got to fly them on that's we don't have to but that's the best way to do it typically and of course 
That's right in the drone's wheelhouse. Okay, is there a restriction of 150 foot of spraying by road? Okay, so um, this is you're talking, you're asking about the under 44807 137 um, uh, exemptions. So, sort of, it's actually 500 feet, but there's a safety case that everybody gets a safety case now. Whenever we we send off our exemptions um, for all of, all of our customers, uh, safety cases is attached. Uh, what that basically states is that you know, yada, 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 this drone's been proven safe. Um, and so every exemption that you know, has been granted, uh, or most every exemption, uh, has a safety case where that buffer is reduced to 50 feet, I believe, is what that is. Um, and Charlie may pop on here and tell me I'm wrong, but I think it's 50 feet. All right, uh, T40 versus T20P in hilly steep si pasture situations. Could see the T20P being better in hilly situations because of battery life, but smaller tank. Uh, but the T40 has a big tank, but shorter battery life. All right, Ryan. Um, again, I'm a big T T20P guy. Uh, I like it a lot. Um, and when we look at pasture applications, you know, we know that that your um, all your pasture herbicides, your group four herbicides work well, work well in ultra low volume. There's been testing done at a gallon per acre with a lot of these products and they work well. So tank size doesn't have to be a limiting factor necessarily in that situation. Um, and then when you're doing pastures, you're probably going to have a lot of trees to navigate around, um, hills to navigate over. Um, and maybe you're, maybe you can't get across the ditch with the truck and you got to fly up and over the, the ditch or the trees to get back to the back. Uh, which is right up the T20P's wheelhouse. Um, so now, unless you're doing huge rangeland type situation, then I, T20P is is where I would lean. Um, you're going to save some money doing that too. Um, and I'll kind of talk about the uh, the DJI Relay right here. I don't I don't have one around me, um, but there's there's a DJI Relay. It's called DJI Relay. It's basically uh, like a mesh network um, for connection. So the DJI system connection system is 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 great. Um, the remote to the drone. You don't have anything in, in between there. Um, and it has very good range as is. But of course, when you're operating low to the ground um, and you have hills or trees or things you're operating over and around and whatnot, um, you can have connection issues if you get interference between the drone and the remote. So there's a DJI Relay base station essentially that you set up on a on a 30 foot pole extendable pole you can put it out on top of a hill somewhere as long as the remote can see the relay and talk to it then the relay can talk to the drone so in situations where you've got very hilly steep pastures uh either the t t40 t20p can use the relay um but i would lean t t20p all right uh, Nathan says, okay, I'm thinking about spraying on the side. I currently work for Helena. Um, not a huge drone market down here in my area right now, but I'm sure it's coming. How would I become a dealer? All right, great. Um, yes, of course, we are looking at uh, growing our, our dealer network. Of, um, now, we, you know, I, at the top, I said we focus heavily on knowledge, education, and support and we do expect the same things from our from our dealers um and now we support our dealers i want our dealers to support their customers um and how do you support your customers you get a drone um and you understand it um you know where we see our most successful dealers it's it's where they have gone through a spray season uh custom application because then they know the headaches uh then they know the do's and don'ts uh you've gone through it essentially and that's how that's how a you can support and b um you can you can sell so you got to get a drone that's that's really the only way uh to become a dealer um at least with us because we 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 want good support out there all right uh with the mapping drones are you able uh, okay with mapping drones are you able to see uh different types of weeds and pastures like for instance large patches of leafy spurge yeah cool um so yes and no i'll explain um so the the mapping drone itself isn't i mean it's it's the one taking the pictures 
but it's not the uh, the ones recognizing the weeds. And so, yeah, really any mapping drone, especially the M3, M, M3T, they have great cameras on them. Um, so you can fly them um, and take good enough pictures um, to get the detail of uh, those weeds, especially if it's different color. Okay, if, if, it, if it's a different color and pixel pattern, essentially pattern, uh, than the crop um, that you're trying to identify it against, then yes. Uh, with a tool like uh, like the Magic tool um, with Pix4D, uh, you can train, you know, once you get that imagery pulled in, you basically you know click on that leafy spurge um, as a wanted attribute, click on you know the crop or whatever, um, anything that you don't want it to recognize as a as an attribute and it will automatically pick out any cells that look like leafy spurge um and then bingo you got your spot spraying map and so all right we i haven't been too excited about software for a long time uh with spray drones i didn't think that any of it was really worthwhile frankly um until uh pix4d they've got some really really cool and easy to use tools um so uh, it's, it's the first thing that really excited me. It's actually why we, we just became dealers with them. Um, uh, so, uh, yeah, uh, you're going to be doing that spot spraying where we'll have a package actually we're putting together because everybody wants to know how to do this. Um, then you get an M3M or M3T, you, your choice. Um, you get picks 4 d and, uh, again, I think, uh, for this situation, T20P, but of course you can use T40 for that as well. Um, and then, Okay, Brian's answering your question down there. <laughs> All right. Um, so Lane asks, I have been doing pastures at three gallon per acre and recently went down to 2.5 with a 25 foot swath and seems to be getting similar results. Would you be comfortable going to two gallon per acres at a 25 foot swath on the T40? All right, cool. We have a drone user here. This is awesome. Um, so yeah, actually I just looked at the grays on uh raise on next label today uh talking to a guy and two gpa two gallons per acre is the minimum volume for aerial application on the label uh so yeah absolutely um and we've we've done we've done a ton of stuff um at two gallons per acre herbicide wise and even one gallon per acre herbicide wise um and yeah anything pasture droop four herbicide is going to work great at a low volume as long as you are covering this the the swath getting enough overlap, um, then yeah, no problem. Uh, all right, anonymous attendee, online part store in the works. Um, yeah, am I screen sharing? No, I'm not. Give me a moment here. Uh, yes. Here we go. Um, not live yet but going live hopefully Friday. Uh, hey, Johnny. Uh, when can we expect new firmware? Huh. Um, good question. Uh, we are, I mean, I know there's, so the things that are being tested right now with the T40 are, um, terrain following um and flight speed increasing flight speed okay those are kind of antonyms i guess um but so though but in those those things i mean uh there's there could be a high casualty rate if they get them wrong and so we want to make sure that they're properly tested no timeline yet this winter uh what are you hearing for the average rate people are charging per acre of the drone uh, from Eleanor. So, um, we charge 15 bucks an acre, uh, with our applications for fungicide, uh, work. Um, you know, the, the, the range is from, from 10 to 20 plus, uh, per acre really depends on area and need. Um, you know, our, our folks up in, um, uh, Wisconsin on the great lakes, um, where you've got tar spot, just, you know, devastating some of the corn crop up there. Um, where you know demand for application is super high and you want really high quality application then the other guy charging 20 bucks an acre up there for that uh, for drone application um so it just depends on the market 
Okay, and uh, can you uh, can you charge extra for mapping? All right. Again, it all boils down to what's the value and what are the needs of the customer, i.e. the farmer. A pretty map with pretty colors doesn't do a farmer really any good. Um, what farmers need is farmers need actionable advice. Um, and if when they have that actionable advice, it's even better if they have someone who can take that action for them. Um, so if you can map a farmer's field um, and then, you know, go out there, you have to, you got to go out. If, if it tells you this area of the field is, is low, low, low health. Okay. Well, why is it low health? Uh, so you got to go out there and you got to actually look at it with your own eyes and see, is it because of uh, disease? Is it because of uh, low nitrogen? Is it because of whatever? And then you can provide that information to the farmer and then you can create a prescription map and, and, uh, and take care of it. So what, yeah, can you charge extra for it? You can, but you got to do more than just map. Okay. Cody says, will there be anything that is double uh, the T40 as in flight time and capacity? Um, not that I know of. Um, no, there's, uh, when it comes to capacity, you know, are we going to see a drone that is that much bigger than the T40? uh that is widely adopted okay we're going to see drones that are that are all that are bigger than the, than the t40 there already are drones that are, that are bigger but are they widely adopted um no um and are they going to get that much bigger in my opinion no so there's several factors transportability is one uh t40 is very easy to transport um cost is another the bigger the drone the higher the cost and when it crashes even higher the cost um another is battery so you look at like the helio 272 that's a 72 liter drone so that is uh what about 70 percent larger um than the t40 in capacity uh the batteries for the for the helio 272 um are let's see a uh, hundred and sixty percent larger so 70 percent larger tank 160 percent larger batteries same flight time that's because the bigger the drone the bigger the batteries bigger the batteries the bigger the batteries because it just weighs more so your battery size exponentially increases as your tank volume increases um to get the same flight time and your swath does not increase the the, the helio 272 does not have a wider swath despite what they say uh we've seen it um it so your efficiency is not going to be 70 percent more because your swath is not 70 percent more and your speed is not 70 percent more so there you go. Swarming. That's what's going to be the uh, efficiency increaser is regulations for swarming. Uh, okay. Have you ever sprayed over timber for brush honey, bush honeysuckle with a drone? Do you have any tips? I'm assuming fly slow to maximize downforce. Bingo, Isaac. Um, yes. So my tips are um, if you're using a T40, um, you can go into the settings and you can turn off the auto terrain follow where it doesn't actually use the radar it just flies at a fixed height and you can manually adjust it as it go um so do that so you don't have to use the uh the the, the terrain following radar and then um uh yeah slow with big droplets and use a dra use plenty of drift reducing adjuvant uh or like uh, mso you know crop oil wouldn't be a bad idea make that make that those droplets heavy make them clump together um so that you can get them Get them down there and yeah fly slow higher volume so five gallons per acre maybe i don't know um it's uh it, it does work if you do it right um do you have like any layout plans for your tender trailers ryan were you answering this one okay i'll let you answer it <laughs> um Okay, what is the new max speed on the T40? If a new update comes out, what is your guess? All right. Um, well, I know what we're requesting and kind of what they have said that they would do is, uh, gosh, I haven't done the conversion yet. 13.8 uh, meters per second. Um, currently, it's 10 meters per second, 32 feet per second. Um, I don't know what that is in feet per second. I haven't done the conversion yet. It's, it's it's just a 
pretty new thing that they've said um, that they would do. Um, anyways, that's my guess. Also, I saw one of you uh, from Eleanor. I saw one of your you your videos that you were working on a mixing system. Yes, we're working on a mixing system. Um, and would love to get it out there to everybody. But here's the thing. Again, service support is pretty big for us. And we want to make sure that when we send something out there, it's going to work. And if it doesn't work, you're going to get to be able to get it fixed and get, and get it supported. Um, and so uh, we... Uh, I am uh, just finished up some a new firmware update on that system that we're currently testing um, to increase some um, uh, ease of use and um, and reliability. And then we start making them, and then we start sending them out and train our team on how to solve your issues. So uh, the plan is to have these released by spring. All right, that's all of them on the Q and A. Looks like. You've got That's three or so on the normal chat. All right. Cool. Thanks, Ryan. I'll uh, pull that chat up. All three are towards the bottom. Okay. Um, yeah. Okay. So you, you answered all these on the top, it looks like. Yep. Cool. Thank you. Um, all right. Do you recommend the use of RTK? Uh, so do I recommend it? It's, uh, um, I don't know if I recommend it, it just depends what you're doing. Really? Uh, we, we do not use RTK on what we do about 90% of the time we're doing whole field coverage, whole field application. We don't use RTK, um, because it's, uh, not really needed. Um, RT. So sometimes you might hear, uh, maybe even us talk about um, if you have really hilly fields, you need RTK. Um, well, RTK alone does not solve your hilly field problem. Um, you need three-dimensional flight route mapping with the use of Terra or um, Smart Farm Web um, and a mapping drone. Um, in order for the T40 or T20P to utilize that three-dimensional flight route, you have to have it hooked up to RTK. Um, so that's when you want RT RTK is any kind of three-dimensional flight route, you know, orchard, stuff like that. Um, so options for RTK are, um, DJI base stations, um, and, or, or Digifarm is a great tool as well. Um, we're a dealer for Digifarm, uh, because again, it was one of those tools that was, uh, it was just so good we couldn't we couldn't pass it up. Well, I've I've got like eighty base stations that I've been sitting on for a long time, um, and they they work great um, for certain applications for sure. Um, but yeah, Digifarm is also a great tool. Okay, in a spot spraying from Brian in a spot spraying situation, if you only filled a T forty halfway, would the T twenty still be more efficient than the T forty? Um, Yes, it would. Now, if you don't do that much spot, if you have a T40, you don't do that much spot spraying, um, then just use a T40. Yeah, just don't don't fill the tank all the way. You're not going to get the same flight time you're going to get out of, out of a T20P. It's not quite as transportable, maneuverable, um, but is it worth spending the money on a T20P just for the five spot spraying applications you do? Probably not. Um, yeah, I will say uh, if, if you're considering a, a, a drone for the first time, um, I would not look past the T20P, um, especially if you're going to have a mix of spot spring and whole fit application. We've got we've got custom application crews that run T20Ps um, on whole fields. I love them. Cost wise, it's great. Transportability wise, it's, it's great. And efficiency wise, don't sacrifice all the efficiency. Um, it's not half the efficiency. Um of, of, a, of a T40 and well, depending on what you're doing, but yeah. Um, okay. All right, here we go. Um, I have a T40 and had a problem with it stopping at a tree line and could not get it to do anything else. Do I need to set a boundary to get around that tree line? All right. Um, well, I'm assuming it was flying 
there's a tree line and it's flying towards the tree line um, and it's stopping as it flies towards the tree line and it wouldn't slide over to the next pass. Um, either that or it's flying too close to the edge of the tree line and keeps stopping. Okay, so in the situation where you fly towards the tree line and it stops, then it puts on the emergency brake probably. So you got to back it up to take the brake off and then look on the right side of your screen. It'll say break point, return point one, return point two. On your map, it will have a purple one and two. So return point two, well, if you hit that, hit go, it will slide over the next pass, start spraying back the other way. Um, so that's how you get it uh, solved in the moment. Um, but of course, we always recommend uh, do not map close to tree lines. Stay 30 40, 50 feet away, you can always do a cleanup pass because um, those headaches uh, can be a big problem. If it is, if you, it was stopping because it was flying parallel to a tree line and it kept sensing it, uh, that's your side obstacle detection. Um, that's in your sensor settings, radar settings. You can take that down to 13 feet. Um, so where it won't stop um, until it senses an obstacle that's 13 feet to the side of it, basically, um, then it'll stop. And so you may have to actually, you know, do a manual, you know, pass um, down that, that tree line without your obstacle avoidance on, uh, or again, just map further away and then manual pass. Okay. That's all of them on the chat. It's just back to the Q&A stuff now. Okay, cool. All right. Eleanor, how much uh, am I going to charge uh, for the mixing system? Uh, up in the air a bit right now. Um, we're, um, yeah, up in the air right now, um, depending on how we release it, uh, anywhere between 5,000 and 8,000 bucks, um, for a mixing system. Uh, any updates or news on research of weed identification slash spraying technology progress that you guys have seen? Weed identification. Okay. Spraying technology. Um, not really, Johnny. Um, I mean, you know, the PIX 4D stuff, um, but, you know, as far as like weed ID on the spraying drone that it'll sense weeds and turn on and turn off, um, as it flies across the field. No, there's a company that claims they can do this with, with a, with a drone, their drone, um, precision AI. They're currently in the startup phase, um, I'm always very skeptical of things like this, um, but they, they claim that, that they can do this. Um, I've talked to them. It seems like a, like a good team they got there. Um, so really looking forward to seeing more out of that um, for sure. Uh, okay, does a drone have a life expectancy as far as how many acres or flight hours before it's worn out and needs replaced? Okay, um, good question. The answer is, I don't have an answer um, because like we haven't, we haven't like, we haven't seen a drone that hasn't been crashed. You know, that's just, that's just been, you know, run nonstop, you know, just get to the point where it's not worth replacing, you know, the components that are failing because every component is modular. You know, if the pumps go out, replace the pumps, motor goes out, replace the motor. ESC goes out, replace ESC. Um, your frame's going to last a lifetime if you don't crash it. Um, so, you know, you, you just keep, as long as you can keep getting parts, you can keep, you can keep replacing it. It's not like a tractor where when your transmission goes, so does your motor and so does, uh, you know, your, you know, your bearings and, and everything else. And it's just not worth fixing it. You're going to want to replace a drone because there's a more efficient model out there probably um, before you have to replace it. that it all right cool oh we have a raised hand um sorry uh jesse you've been been waiting patient oh take your hand down <laughs> all right no worries if anybody wants to talk ra raise your hand for sure um all right how long till the motor goes out one of uh my t30s has 3600 hour or uh, acres on it i'm assuming it has acres not hours <laughs> um uh, so, uh, good question, Lane. Again, I don't know if we have a solid answer. Have we had, I mean, 
if we had a motor just go out with no reason uh we have but it was uh it was didn't usually when a motor goes out for no reason it's usually low it's usually got low hours on it and it's like a a, a default a defect um as long as you keep motors clean they should last a long long time if you start hearing them make funny sounds then all right maybe i ought to replace it um but we've got guys that have over six thousand acres um on on a t40 um at, at two gallon per acre and haven't replaced motors or escs um at all well it crash if it goes out in the air yeah depending on uh what direction it's flying and how full the tank is and what the wind is yeah can it stay up with with seven motors can just depends um, but usually it'll go out whenever it's under strain meaning it's under strain then it's going to be hard for that other motor to take uh, take over in a quick uh, manner okay Eleanor asks, how about battery life cycle? Uh, any issues with the batteries? Um, no glaring issues with the batteries. Um, you know, the we've had some, so I, I say that probably the biggest issues, and we've, we've done plenty of battery warranties, but we've got, you know, thousands of batteries out there. Um, so we've done plenty of battery warranties, um, you know, the first year of the, of the battery before it hits the life cycle. But uh, a lot of that just seems like... Uh, you know, odd, you know, one-off scenarios. Um, some cases, it seems like maybe uh, a generator is possibly causing the issue. Uh, in some cases, um, it's like the plug on the battery um, actually just, you know, goes out um, for one reason or another. So no, those, those pins break really easy on, not necessarily a break, but they bend if you don't take care of whenever you put them either in the charger or in the drone itself. Yeah. So not just drop them in, actually slide them down in there slowly. Yeah. And, and also make sure that, uh, your power distribution board, the pins on the, on the drone is, is secured well. And it's not like coming up at an angle with the battery as you pull it out. Uh, I have seen that actually destroy full batteries. All right. I think, hey, here we go. Um, is there a cheat sheet or anything to know what gallons per acre to spray? Or do you just go by the air application on the label? Uh, hey, hey, just wing it. Uh, why not? Um, uh, cheat sheet. So, yeah, I mean, yeah, follow label guidelines. I you know. You, I, you want to you wanna do as, as few a gallons per acre as you're allowed to do um, because that increases efficiency so long as it does not harm efficacy. And so far, I haven't seen anything uh, be less effective at a lower volume so long as you're getting a appropriate swath um, out of T40. Uh, we've got guys doing fungicide application at 1.1, which is considered ultra low volume um, uh, and no issues. Here's what I'll say on uh, coverage uh, with with drones just in general. Okay, so the swath width is on a, on a T40. T40 puts out a lot of air. Um, swath width, we've got testing that shows you can achieve a good 34-foot uh, swath if you use DRA and whatnot. Um, but does that mean it's going to provide really good penetration through the canopy at that swath width? No. That doesn't mean that uh, because if it's 34 foot swath route spacing that you're doing, the drone itself, where's most of the air being pushed down underneath the drone, right? That 15 foot in the middle. So that seven or eight foot on the outside is not getting as good a penetration. Um, so, um, you know, that's, that's, that's one thing to consider, I guess, whenever you're looking at lowering rates and whatnot is how good penetration do you need when you, you know, you're looking at flying faster, all that kind of stuff is, is a factor. Okay. Can we buy from you or would you direct us to a dealer closer to us? You're up in Fargo. Um, we are probably not too far from uh, uh, Farmer's Choice um, is up there. Uh, so welcome to buy from us if you'd like. Um, but 
and we would uh, direct you towards a towards a dealer if you would like to localize support and service. We've got one in Ab. Uh, I'm probably butchering this. Aberdeen, uh, in South Dakota, one up in Minot, North Dakota, and Minot or Minot? Minneapolis. Uh, M I N O T. Yeah, it's <laughs> <So> probably Minot. <laughs> Like I said, I'm going to butcher that. <laughs> That's all right. Uh, uh, yeah. Uh, but yeah, Eleanor, just um, just reach out to us, send us an email or something. And uh, yeah, we'll we'll take care of you. Um, will this software ever communicate with AgWorld or Land, uh, LandDB? Database, maybe. Yeah. Or anything like those companies. Okay. I'm actually not even not familiar with AgWorld or LandDB. Um, by communicate, um, do you mean the as applied data or do you mean sharing boundaries, um, or something else that I'm not thinking of? Not sure if you heard me, Cody. All right. Well. I'm going to go ahead and start answering if, if you're typing. Um, so uh, by communicate, if you mean uh, boundaries, um, if so, any, every, any, every ag software uh, in the U S especially um, is going to be able to export shapefile boundaries. Um, and so if you've got boundaries on ag world or land DB, um, then you can export those. You probably in batch actually like a hundred at a time or whatever. Um, as a shape file and then import that right in the T40 remote. So it's really simple, super simple. Um, some caveats to this, it might not be the best way to bring in boundaries um, to the remote just because of you know, a few f factors. Uh, you know, if, if those boundaries were created from a, from a uh, combine or from a, uh, you know, ag equipment as it went around the field, then there might be a lot of points. Okay, around the around the boundaries, then you have to might have might edit those, um, but yeah, you can do that for sure. Um, if by communicate you mean share, okay, as applied data boundaries rates, okay, uh, mainly for data for customers that already use this software, and we can adjust to their way of getting data if we can uh, send and receive through. Okay, gotcha. So yeah, boundaries no problem. Uh, rates. Um, uh, so right now, this is something that we have requested with DJI and they are finally listening to us is, um, a way to input, um, like, uh, product, um, information, uh, application information, you know, um, into the system. Um, so anyways, uh, as applied data right now with all ag software is flight path data. Um, and so it's lines doesn't actually have like a like a geospatial area tied to it so you get lines and you get um it 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 tells you you know how many acres you know on like the smart farm or agms system and it tells you how much total volume uh for that field but the data that you export is actually kml uh, uh file you can convert that to a shape file but it doesn't have actual area tied to it so you bring that into your uh your ag world or land db and if you're wanting to like overlay that on top of like a harvest map so you can see yield by application um type um yield by drone application you know try to re report or a map on that you can't actually do that unless you uh create a la application layer and like make a box around that uh, drone application layer I don't know if I explain any of that at all, but uh, what I'm getting at to uh, getting to is uh, it does not communicate on the as applied part of it. All right, great questions, guys. This has been awesome. All right, I think we have reached the end. If you guys have any other questions, um, you don't want to uh, ask publicly because you don't want to be humiliated um, by the group <laughs> or 
Uh, if there's anything else, uh, then always feel free to call us, text us, email us. Um, be happy to help you. All right, Cody, something similar to John Deere Op Center where we can see these application maps and rates would be awesome. Oh, you, we can. Actually, you can do that. So um, I don't know if, uh, yeah. Do you have, do you have a, uh, what, what drone do you have? I'm going to pull up Smart Farm app. Download this app nice. right there. Yeah, T40. If you don't have a Smart Farm app, then get the Smart Farm app. Um, that that does show you uh, application data in map form. It's not going to be what you're used to maybe on, on John Deere Op Center, but it does show you. Cool. All right. Thank you, Ryan. Uh, yeah. Thank you, everybody. Oh, uh, yeah. You guys are stop you're stopping by. Perfect. Great. I love doing this. Um, uh, yeah. Okay. So you're talking about Smart Farm. Yeah. I love doing this. Uh, we're going to continue to do this, frankly, um, throughout the wintertime. Uh, got another one coming up next Wednesday. I'll do it every Wednesday until I fall over. Uh, how about that? <laughs> okay. a lot of wednesdays <laughs> a lot of wednesdays <laughs> yeah okay happy to help guys uh we will catch you all later have a good night